Well, hello and welcome. <clears throat> well, hello and welcome, everybody, to the Gear Change Show. Here I am, your humble host, Mike Mel, here for a um, another one of these here on a Saturday night here at about 10.37. Uh, I'm going to, I actually slept a little bit today so I could actually be energetic and be fine-tuned for this exciting edition as I talk about the weird and the somewhat crazy uh, world of uh, Japanese GT racing uh, here for here, here tonight's topic. So for those of you who um, so there's different uh, versions of motorsport I guess. So basically so back in so Super GT for those of you who are wondering what is Super GT? Well Super GT um, dates its roots all the way back to uh, the 19 touring car roots back into the 1960s actually um, so Japan uh, has been known for GT touring car racing for um, for many many years I was I was um, for a lot of you race fans out there know about the Suzuka thousand kilometers um, that was raced for quite a few years. Um, they uh, quite a few years. Now the race uh, was different distances over the years. So you know I can't show the photo, any of the photos of the car on the screen, obviously because of copyright, and I'd have to obviously ask permission from them. But you know they raced things like the 2000 GT. Uh, the one, you know, the one James Bond drove in the movie, uh, the movie, uh, the one with the twice, uh, the early Nissan Skyline GTRs, um, the 1970 to 1973 editions, um, and many other cars exactly like it. Um, GT racing kind of, touring car slash GT racing kind of fell off the map a little bit, um, in the mid to late 70s because Japan kind of pandered toward the emission regulations due to the oil prices of oil prices going up in the, the oil prices going up in the US and also over in Europe and a lot of the cost of the cars were going up and they also had to kill performance, high performance engines for a while but uh, in the 80s um, we got, we got the silhouette era of, we kind of, if you look at any early Japanese touring cars, you guys will notice, um, you guys will notice, um, you guys will notice that there's, um, that there's uh, quite a bit of enhanced body work on all the cars, and, um, and uh, silhouette racing uh, kind of uh, started in the 80s. Um, so if you want, so if you look at um, Silicas and um, the Nissan Skyline silhouette, super, super, super silhouette car, you know, big wings, exaggerated fenders, and um, they were meant to kind of imitate the Group 5 cars a little bit. Um, and they were also uh, group cars that were in the DRM, and also group four cars for the little, um, for the little touring cars that, that you could buy on the street. You know, Toyotas, Nissans, Datsuns, as they were called over here in the U.S. and over in Europe, and over in before we they were called uh, Nissan or Nissan as we know it. They called Nissan over in over in Europe. We call it Nissan over here. Datsun over there. Um, but those cars gave birth to the idea of the super touring car or the super GT, which led to the Japanese Grand Touring Championship in the late 80s, early 90s. And basically, what they did was the um, what they basically did is a lot of the race teams basically said hmm. so 
what could we do to make these cars to make these cars all good because they because they knew fenders and water tires uh, were kind of were kind of used in another were used in another type of racing and so basically so basically they said well why don't we take one form of racing and why not we take GT racing and combine them into one? They had to figure out what type of what racing they were going to go for and what style they were going to go for and what they were going to use to do this. And they looked at all over the racing. They basically said, oh, we're going to have aerodynamics that are really cool, really different. Um, and we're also going to have engines that are built by the teams, uh, sort of like GT racing. Um, Sort of like GT racing and stuff like that, and we're gonna do what we can to combine them into one. So basically, um, so basically. I can use images out there, they're not if it's on my computer. All rights go up to, um, all rights go up to the, to the, uh, to the people who, uh, made these and made these kind of things. So, um, so what would you get? So basically the Super GT guys basically sat there and said, okay, Let's take properties for something like this, an open wheel car. And basically take it and um, Trying to give you guys an idea of what we wanted. Uh, and make it into a silhouette. -y. Make it into a silhouette GT car like this, and basically let them have a little bit of a have a have a night out, have a dinner, have a frisky night out, have a frisky night in bed, uh, and uh, and uh, marry those all together with weird aerodynamics and you're going to come up with this this is an early uh gt car i'm going to come i'm going to show you guys where that's an nsx from like 19 that's an nsx from from like 1999 And then you um, actually super GT. And you sort of get this exaggerated body, so wet body like this.
as well. That's an Acura NSX right there. So basically, what was an amalgam? Basically, what they did was they took a properties from a Formula One car and took properties from a GT car and molded them into one. You get the Super GT, probably some of the coolest cars on the planet. So, what were the technical specs of the GT car, the Super GT car as well? Well, there was sort of an open engine formula. As long as the chassis was stock, you could do all sorts of modifications to it. You could make aero appendages, anything to create crazy, crazy amounts of downforce. Uh, so much, in fact, that they actually had to raise the power at one point. Um, they were really targeting around 400 and 450, 470 horsepower. And they basically sat there and said, well, we kind of have to give them a horsepower limit and we kind of have to give them classes. So that NSX right there is part of a GT500 class. You can run whatever engine the manufacturer makes as long as it's with, as long as it's homologated and as long as it's in the road car, you can make extensive modifications. So, so if an NSX had a three liter, a three liter, a three liter V6, it's normally aspirated that engine. Yeah, you can run that. <clears throat> Nissan, Nissan or Datsun wants to run a 2.6 liter, uh, wants to run a 2.6 liter. Uh, straight six in their NSX with the same body five dimensions. Yeah, you can run that too Toyota wants to run a 2.1 liter turbo in their Supra This is back in the 90s in the 90s cars. Yeah, you can run with the heck you want You can run whatever heck you wanted and they call and they gave these cars a give these cars a horsepower horsepower limit of 500 hence the name GT 500 and then they kind of made a, and then they were like, well, we kind of have to make a lesser class for cars that don't have the same displacement, but are more production based. And they have to have the production engines, but we can make some weird modifications and make some weird stuff. So uh, GT300 was basically the same thing. Uh, take a formula style body chassis and take a stock body and mold it into one, except you could put whatever engine the manufacturer had, well, at least in the last couple of, last in the last decade you could. Um, so if you wanted to run, uh, so if you were Subaru and you wanted to run a, a two liter turbo, uh, the two liter turbo boxer engine, yeah, you could run that. Um, you wanted to run a, you wanted to run a, a lesser version of a of it. You want to run a lesser version of a Toyota Supra with a two point with a with, with a normally aspirated engine. Yeah, you could run that too. Or how about make the weird? Or how about make some weird prototypes that were really, really, really were that were really crazy? And then there was and then there's also thing this thing called the mother chassis. So basically, what the mother chassis is is it's a um, Mother chassis is, it's a, um, well, it's used nowadays. It's basically a shell of either a Supra or a Lexus RCF. And Lexus RCF. And it's basically put into the body of a Prius Prius I mean they even put a stuff the 3.4 liter um, they even stuff the 3.4 liter uh, LMP1 engine from a from a Toyota LMP1 car into the back of a Prius and made 500 and made about struck down to about 350 400 horsepower um, well now it well actually and then uh, in so they actually are some pretty cool race cars and yeah sure we got some pretty cool racing out of it and we did have some amazing uh, we've got some amazing racing out of it and we also got some fantastic battles 
but unfortunately, like most motorsports, because they were spending too much money and teams were trying to get a leg up on each other, um, because every single year, what happened was, is, is it's like every other racing series, they basically, they basically evolve their regulations in order to, um, in order to stay with the current times. And in order to do that, you also have to, you also have to increase your technology and increase your, um, and also increase your uh, appeal to other other manufacturers because uh, GT350, GT3, GT500, and GT300 were limited to, at the time, Japanese manufacturers in the Japanese Grand Touring Car Championship uh, turned into the Autobox Super GT Championship, uh, I think like 10 years ago. And, well, the lowest power race in the wars ended up getting too costly. And the officials basically said, well, we're going to control costs. We got to make everything spec, but we'll make it up to the, but we'll make it up to the teams to actually run the body, the chassis, and uh, the development of the car so that it can be competitive, uh, which kind of led to uh, the rule of um, the maximum engine size being four and a half liters, four and a half liter V8 engine in the car. I think this was in 2004, 2005, uh, where they actually did this. Uh, the NSX was a little different because that could have a 3.4 liter engine because it was normally aspirated and it kind of controlled the um, it controlled the uh, the manufacturer's ability to um, really um, it controlled the manufacturer's ability to actually um, to actually use certain engines. Um, so teams basically lost the ability to gain speed on the straightaway because power stagnated. Uh, power actually dropped in the early 2000s from about 500 or so to about 460, 470, 480. So teams were looking for um, that that advantage where they could actually make the cars more appealing and most of the teams looked at most of the circuits and they said, huh, well, our cars have better aero than, well, our cars have are, have better aero than most GT cars and a lot of our circuits that we go to are very flowing and are, and are very good for downforce and they basically said, huh, well, if Formula One can do it, uh, we're gonna do it. So that's what the Formula One style um, stuff kind of came into play. Um, as you guys saw in the 2008 NSX, uh, the fenders got more, um, the con the tires got bigger, the contact patch got a lot better. Uh, there was a flat bottom, they also introduced a better flat bottom floor. Almost overnight, 2004, five, six, and seven, five, and six, top cornering speeds went up and the cars were getting faster and faster, so fast in fact, that the uh, that they became the fastest GT cars on the planet. And a lot of you are going to sit there and roll your heads. And a lot of people sit there going to roll your heads. Well, they, well, that can't be true. A GT1 car or a Corvette would be able to run, run that thing on the streets and I'll corner it because it is better aerodynamics. And having all that power would would certainly do great yeah that's awesome so back in 2004 um, they entered a um, Maserati GT1 class car um, that was running at that was actually running over in Japan at the time and there was a Japanese team that wanted to test it because they were going to try to turn it into a GT500 car and turn it into a silhouette car. Um, and they thought that they were actually going to uh, use it 
as a uh, prototype style car because the car had prototype dimensions and the Super GT actually had prototypes actually had prototypes and they, they were like oh this is going to be awesome this is going to be great um, and uh, one of the GT teams was actually sat there and said oh we're actually going to actually be able to win this thing on sheer horsepower alone because because there's no way these cars will be able to kill them. Sure, they'll make that up in the corners, but they won't be able to make it up on the straights. They won't be able to sure them. Sure, they do great cornering, but they don't have any straight line speed. Um, just to put it this way, uh, on Fuji's uh, main straightaway, uh, they actually took a Maserati GT1 car, uh, Maserati MC12, and it actually went 20 miles an hour faster than the Super GT car. I'll drag it on the street. And the Maserati guys were like, oh yeah, yeah, this is great. We're, we're 20 miles an hour faster. We're not going to... Only to find out that the cars were actual... That the Super GT cars could actually maintain better cornering speeds. And that is where actually the cornering... Where the cars actually made up the speed. Um, if they couldn't do the... If they couldn't do that. Same thing with the Formula One cars in 2017 through 2017 through 2021, 2021, where they had big wings, very aerodynamics, and they were slower and slower, but they got faster and faster as they went through. So, so yeah. So the reason why they thought about this. The reason why they got this idea, the reason why they got this idea is because they basically looked at the, and they basically, the Maserati guys, basically took the, basically took a look at this thing. Basically took a look at this thing. That is a Mooncraft Shinbin RT. Mooncraft Shinbin RMC. M MCRT. It's basically it's um, basically it's a um, a lot of, and the guys were like, oh wow, if we can get it uh, to if we can homologate it into uh, if we can homologate that we can if, if we could if they can homologate uh, Shinden, then we can do that and we can do this and this and this with this. Um, yeah, that was great. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was great and everything. And it had a two-liter and it had a Toyota V8 with up to 4.4 liters and 460 horsepower. But the car weighed like 2,500 pounds, which is a lot. Which is what the Super GT weighed, and they were like, um, "Yeah, we're not gonna do anything with this." Oh yeah, by the way, this is also another car that they. This is another car that they actually have. This is a this is a VMAC RD320. This thing has an Audi V6 or V8 or whatever, whatever, whatnot, whatnot. This is a that's a that's an RMAC from a uh, Fuji 250 kilometer race. It's ba it basically looks like a Porsche 911 uh, and an amalgamation of a Honda NSX a Daytona prototype a, and a Mazda RX-7 yeah so yeah so yeah so that's what that happened um, now the regulations for the four and a half liter cars ended up not lasting long because again cost cutting was was kind of intended and they wanted to be more um, they want to be more on the cutting edge uh, and stuff like that. But back in, but what happened was is the reason why they had to go to a small formula to uh, get better dynamics, get a better shape, get a lot of body was because the uh, the organizers of the Super GT uh, ended up introducing a skid plate on the bottom of the cars, 
and, and a skid plate on the bottom of the cars and that slowed the cars down so the cars actually needed better engines so I think it was like 2009 2010 that uh, the um, Super GT organizers or the Autobox Super GT organizers uh, mandated everybody to use three and a half liter V8 engines um, and each manufacturer had one Toyota used uh, at the time to well at the time now Toyota you Toyota had the Toyota used the Supra and up to like 2005 and it, so Toyota you switched to Lexus that that was used with the RC 430 which had a huge aerodynamic advantage if you guys want to read that story it basically they basically turned a convertible into a GT car, basically. Yeah, that SC40, run the thing with the full rooftop that uh, nobody wanted, and it cost like, like a jillion dollars for Lexus to buy, and the roof was was totally terrible. Yeah, they tried to make that into a GT car, and it failed mis and it was semi-successful, and they had to do a few things. Uh, Honda had the, Honda did not have the NSX. Honda went from the NSX to the HV, HSV 10 with that three and a half liter engine and it sounded like a Formula One car and it basically looked like a futuristic NX it was based on this future NSX um, GT car which was kind of a theme with uh, Nissan uh, with uh, Acura Honda in the next couple of years and then they rode that for from 2008 um, I think they rode that formula from like 2009 2010 to like 2014 when they switched to the current class one turbo regulations with the two liter turbo with a um, with uh, two liter turbo and that's actually where we currently have that so um, but you were wondering how was the racing really with all this stuff like that racing was really good um, they had very good parity and just and just so one manufacturer didn't win it all and win it all and dominate every season. Um, they actually had to. Do, they actually had. Um, they actually had a few full. They actually had air restrictors that would limit the power, and they would also. Um, they would also add uh, ballast weight or success weight. So if you won one race, you got like 25 kilograms, which is like about 50 pounds. And if you won another race, you won another 25. So that's 50 kilograms, 110 pounds. I think you could get up to a maximum of like 100 kilograms, 80, kilo, 80 to 100 kilograms, which is about 200 pounds on your car. Um, and that severely hand affected how your car handled and how it raced. So you basically had to uh, finish a certain way or you had to have a bad result or something like that. Or you had to, uh, you had to stay in the points, but you had to be very consistent. You had to be very strategic on how you actually scored your points and how you did that. Because if you won a lot, they they were going to penalize you a lot, and you'd have to lose. And if you lost, and if you lost a race, or if you didn't win one, or if you scored outside the points, or if you retired, you lost your ballast, and you were able to return to normal. Uh, they still do that today, um, although they do limit horsepower a little bit. Uh, with uh, fuel flow ratings because most FIA slash GT racing is done by the fuel flow meter slash air restrictor so and such and so forth um, but yeah it was an interesting time um, and the names that, that were attra that, that got attracted uh, Andrea Lottera, who won Le Mans, uh, Jens Buttons, been in there. A lot of Super GT guys. Um, I know um, a lot of big names have done it. So a lot of big names that well, that uh, raced in GT racing, motorcycle racing, have all raced in Super GT. It is very competitive. It's actually very cool. They're actually very cool cars to drive. In fact, I actually like driving them on Grand Turismo a lot because of how their aerodynamics are. It's amazing how how GT can uh, how GT can how the GT games can get the cornering rates on these cars. So you can fly. I'll put it this way: 
you go to Suzuki, you can actually fly, you can actually lift and you actually can lift and coast through the corner and fly through the corner. If you get the trajectory right, you can coast and fly through the corner faster than, than you can say, oh my god, because it's such a cool aerodynamic engine that car. And, and actually, they were actually going to make them uh, actually be able to compete with DTM cars because DTM cars actually had the same engines at one point, but unfortunately, since it's now a GT3 series, um, they can't do that. Speaking of GT3, um, speaking of GT3, um, GT3 cars actually compete now. So you can have mod, so you can have BMWs, Lamborghinis, Corvettes, um, Mercedes Benz, SLS, AMGs, and, uh, Aston Martin V Advantages all compete, all compete in there. But eh, that doesn't stop for some weird cars being um, some. Where your car is being made, so, um, so as I said, in the, in, in, and and uh, going to GT three hundred, GT three hundred has some pretty interesting cars. You saw the Shinden and you saw the V the V Mac. Um, the cars that got made in the two thousands and stuff like that is really 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 weird. So, I think in like 2010, 2011, um, the uh, 2012-ish before they switched over uh, a Honda CRZ used to have a 2.8 liter uh, twin turbo LP2 engine um, Toyota Priuses used to have used to have and I'll show you one of uh, or Toyota Corolla I'll show you a Toyota Corolla or Toyota Corolla is kind of kind of funky kind of funky and you'll, you'll just sit there and you're like oh that doesn't look like my Corolla that does not look like my Corolla. A lot of you people are like, oh yeah, Corollas, they're so cool looking. They're awesome. They're they're great. They're great cars. They're awesome. And, and a lot of you guys who are into tuner culture are probably like, oh yeah, we got buddy kids and we have cars of turbos and nitrous and they look so sick. Well, That is a Toyota Corolla from Super GT. That's a Toyota Corolla from Super GT. That's a Corolla. That's a Toyota Corolla Axio, um, Axio car. And you want to guess which? And you want to guess what type of engine it's got? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller. <laughs> Bueller. <laughs> um, Bueller. Bueller. This TRD engine is is actually is actually powered by a V6 engine with 300 horsepower. As I said, GT3. As I said, GT300, 300 horsepower. Uh -huh. I think they made. I think by the time they were done, they were making about 400. And I think they were making about 450 horsepower. Uh, I don't know if Corollas are currently. I know Corollas are currently. Corollas can compete, but they have to use a Lexus engine. But they use. But they have to use a. Uh, well, actually, but they have to use a smaller engine. I think they can use hybrids too. But oh, oh, I'll show you a Toyota Prius Super GT. All you guys are probably like, well, it's a Toyota Prius. There's, there's not much they can do. There's not much they can do with that thing. It must be a, it's a total block. There's no way they can do anything with, there's no way they can do anything with that.
So you guys are probably like, oh, Toyota Prius. It's a, it's a, it's a Prius. It's a Prius. It's nothing. It's not going to be anything. It's going to have a little hybrid engine. There's no way that can compete. There's no way a Toyota Prius engine can make 300 horsepower. That's a Toyota Prius from that era. Not joking. So, yeah. So, and that had a three and a half liter. And that had a three and a half liter um, Toyota LMP1 engine making 300 horsepower. It's the two from 525 to 300. Yeah, that existed. Now they have uh, now they have Lexus V8s now but making. Now they have Lexus V. Now Toyota Supras and all the Priuses and all those other cars have Lexus V8s now because they can't do it. It's either that or a four and a half liter V6 or something like that from some other manufacturer or whatever. They they kind of it's called a mother chassis. It's kind of a spec chassis. Spec chassis for people who just don't want to run run that. But that's just kind of super GT for you. As I said. This is coming from the land of the rising sun, the land of the rising sun. Anime characters that that have paper, that have pencil thin, that pencil thin waist. Probably girls who have waist about as about as thin as this, probably about as thin as probably as thin curvy as this bottle, and cast sizes the size of the size of the, the size of uh, freaking grapefruits, and the size of freaking watermelon. So yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually into Japanese anime. I like Dragon Ball Z and um, Yu-Gi-Oh and all that other stuff. And it's kind of the weird thing, you know. Uh, the uh, the Japanese kind of have a weird, uh, since they have kind of a weird uh, kink, so to speak, with uh, other ordinary things. And um, you know, Super GT is kind of is kind of that thing. So. Um, so basically, they went from little kitted up uh, and they went up from little tuned up uh, 200 2000 GT cars all the way to uh, GT cars all the way up to uh, freaking uh, super super touring cars super touring cars with over 600 horsepower they make about six, 700, 650 horsepower now and oh boy are they not cool cars or what um, so yeah, um, so yeah, well guys, um, I definitely wanted to definitely make this video. I've always been a fan of Super GT, um, I was always a fan of the racing, and it's always good to just do that, so, um, to, to cover the GT racing series, because, uh, you know, the world of GT racing and automotive racing is expansive and it's amazing. So, so yeah. Um, that's all I got for tonight. Alright, guys, I'll be, I'll be here for a video. I'll be here for a video uh, tonight. Um, I'll be here for a video tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon. Um, I'm going to be watching the Formula One Grand Prix because I want to, so I want to see Ferrari finally kick, finally kick some Red Bull ass. So, um, so I hope you guys enjoyed um, me talking about Super GT and you guys learning about a weird and wacky racing series and some cool cars that were. Um, that we're done. Uh, if you guys want to see any more Super GT um, cars, um, look it up on YouTube, look it up on Wikipedia, uh, look up uh, Nissan GTR, uh, GT500, um, 90s or the 2000s, and uh, you know the different regulations. You can watch the races, the replay races in English on YouTube all day long. Um, the races are usually races are usually 300 to usually two 250 to 300 kilometers long I think the longest race they kind of do is 500 um, I think they do is 500 uh, they used to do um, they um, 
I don't think they do the race anymore. I don't think they do the um, Suzuka thousand kilometers. I think it's on a 700 kilometer race now. Um, 700 kilometer race now. That's also that's like the Le Mans 20. That's like the 24 hour. That's like the Petit Le Mans of uh, the of that endurance event. And um, yeah, so just some insane speed. You know, some insane speeds. Some wacky engineering. Uh, it's basically what you get when you take a GT1 car from the 90s and you, you marry it with the aerodynamics of a Formula 1 car or a Formula 3000 car. A little gestation happens and you get a car that uh, you get the car that will outspeed anything. In fact, they have higher lap records around the world. Higher lap records. You can look at GT1 and GT1, GT3 cars. They all they're all faster, even the even the full out, um, even the full on, um, fully evolved GT3 cars have have the same thing. So yeah, I'll see you guys later, and if you guys learned something today, and um, I'll see you guys later. Peace.